Hey, everybody, it's Brad and Dave, and uh, we're doing something a little bit different this week. We uh, record these podcasts about four weeks ahead, but this week there was a bit of news we needed to talk about right away. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and insert this at the top of this show. Yeah, and 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 in case you've been uh, living on another planet, uh, we're talking about the recent shittiness of Dilbert creator Scott Adams spouting racist remarks uh, suggesting a resegregation in America. This comes after a decade of not so dog whistly comments on women and race. Yeah, and it's it's a kind of the cumulative effect too of years and years of ass hattery uh, that reached a breaking point, and he was dropped first, if I remember correctly, by like three hundred papers or so. Yeah. And then the day following by his syndicate, <laughs> and then the day following that by both of his publishers, Penguin and Andrews McMeal. Yeah. And and honestly, and obviously, if you've listened to Brad and I for even two seconds, you know that we condemn his remarks and bullshit like that in the strongest possible terms. He was racist, he was harmful, and he was ignorant. Uh, but honestly, to spell, spend any further time talking about this guy uh, is basically giving him what he wants. Uh, he he wants this attention. He wants us yeah. to talk about us. And, and, and honestly, Dave and I talked about this before the show. We don't want to do that. We don't want to give this guy any more attention than he's already getting. We'd rather talk to the young cartoonists uh, who are, might be listening to the show who maybe thinks that Adams represents the comics community. That's, Absolutely, that's what we want to talk about. Yeah. Here's the bottom line. That guy is full of shit. And yes, yeah. we know he's not the only guy in the world that's full of shit about stuff like that. But but, but listen, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Listen to us. <laughs> All right. Listen to us. And we say that you are welcome here. That's that's what we want to tell you. To put a fine point on it, listen to two old, boring, white, straight guys tell you that you don't need his permission. Yeah. You don't need our permission. Right. Cartooning is yours and cartooning uh, needs you, really. We've said right. this before, but cartooning needs and gets better with the more voices that come into it. Um, right. So that that's the bottom line for us. Yeah. So here's 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 what we want. to Here's our message to you. Make good comics, make great comics and know that there's a community of people cheering you on every step of the way. Well, Dave, I screwed up again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my my wife's birthday was last weekend, and uh, we we've kind of in the past kind of avoided uh, buying you know li little tchotchkes and stuff like that. But I, I thought this this year it might be kind of fun to get a couple things and open them up. Sure. And so we we surprised her with a with a homemade cake, and and uh, the the kids actually went out on their own volition and got a couple things and. So I got a couple things. She's been working in a home office uh, ever since COVID. Uh, and it sounds like they're going to stay with the home office uh, at the place she works. And uh, so I got her some stuff to kind of spruce up uh, the little corner of the living room she works in. One of the things I got her, Dave, was something that it's 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 supposed to make dancing rainbows all over the room. OK, it's, okay. It's, 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 it's got this little crystal on it that hangs from a pendulum. And it's got a, a bunch of gears inside. It's clear plastic so you can see the gears work and a solar panel. The ideal is you put it with the suction cup up on the window. The sun hits the solar panel, makes the little pendulum spin, and it, it, the crystals catch the light and send little dancing rainbows all around the room. Oh, that's nice. And we've had it up for three days now. Not a single dancing rainbow. Not, not even, not even a stationary rainbow. Not even a wallflower a ra rainbow. No, there's been nothing. I, 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 I think I might have gotten taken by the rainbow by big rainbow. <laughs> this, this either speaks to Philadelphia winters where maybe the sun has not achieved a level where it could activate a solar panel at this point. Yeah. That's one possibility. Or maybe this speaks to the fact that you've been doing all of your, your gift shopping at the dollar store and that, <laughs> that thing is not really ready to, for prime time. Yeah, listen, it, it, I made, I might have made some purchasing decisions I, I that I, I regret. And, and, it, and But listen, it wasn't the dollar store, all right? It was... 
It was five below, which is a much more upscale market. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I saw her yesterday walking past the, the, the little crystal thing, and I caught her sh- just quietly shaking her head. And I, and I think that I think that behooves bad things for our marriage. Now, I think I got to go back to not buying gifts. I was much safer not buying gifts. There is a certain joy, though, in, in many years of being successfully married where you can find new and interesting ways to quietly disappoint your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I see the crystal. Yeah. Yeah, I see what he tried yeah. to do. Oh, God. I, I, is that what they mean when they say keeping a marriage fresh is, is finding new <laughs> yeah, ways? You got to of... you gotta get a new crystal just... thing in here that doesn't work for hell. Uh, so, yeah. our kids, so we're recording this on Valentine's Day. Any, any special yeah. Valentine's going on at the Brad Geiger house? That we don't do a lot for Valentine's Day because I obviously, listen, if, if you were married to me, knowing what I just told you, you wouldn't <laughs> encourage a whole lot of gift giving. You'd just be, you know what, just just sitting there in the corner and, and draw your cartoons. Uh, and 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 but the one thing I do celebrate every Valentine's Day is that it is the anniversary, in this case, 23 years ago today, I posted my first comic on a GeoCities site. Uh, and, and I've been posting comics uh, every day, if not every week, ever since. I've been Whoa. continually posting and publishing comics. So this is kind of my anniversary of the day I started uh, doing comics on the web. I'm sure that there are listeners to this podcast that are that are younger than your first comic on the web. 23 oh, yeah. years. Brad, that's an incredible achievement. Fantastic. Congratulations. <sighs> I was I was chaperoning a trip uh, for my younger son to Washington D.C. They went to the African Museum of Art and the National Gallery, and one of the teachers there that I was talking to uh, mentioned that she was born in 2000 and that she was 23 years old. And I thought to myself, I, my my comic may be just older than you by just a month or so. <laughs> Do you remember how you first got that comic up on GeoCities? Do you remember how you was like, oh, GeoCities oh. is the place for me? Uh, no, I mean, it was spite. It was spite. I had a drawer full of syndicate uh, 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 rejections and I was going to show them all. I was going to put this thing up on, on GeoCities because you know, where else would you put something in 2000? Yep. And, uh, and, and, and it was going to amass an amazing audience. And all of the people at King Features and United Media were going to gnash their teeth and wring their hands and say, oh, we made the worst decision by sending him a rejection. I'm so sorry about my life decisions. And I would lord it over them and say, well, I don't want you now. I don't want anything to do with you. And 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 I'm, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> the thing the thing that I remember about first first getting a comic up on the web. Do you remember FTP? about getting your yeah. comics up on. Yeah, so Fire, I, file transfer protocol. I was living in England at the time. I was in Canterbury, and I saw a comic strip. I don't know if you're going to remember this, called Bruno the Bandit. I saw it online. I remember it. Ian. And I remember emailing Ian saying, hey, I'm a cartoonist, or trying to be a cartoonist in, I'm currently, in, I'm American currently in England, and I've been sending my syndication packets back to the U.S., very expensively, by the way. I was spending money yeah, and no sending shit. it from the UK to the US and sending my yeah. syndication back. But this seems kind of neat. You're putting your comics on the web. How do you do that? He's like, are you familiar with FTP? And I said, no, I have no idea what FTP is. And bless his heart, Ian talked me through how to get my first comic up on the web in 1998. Wow. And uh, I did it on a student um, a server um, for the University of Kent in Canterbury, and uh, that was my first foray. And I think FTP was our was our go to for the first four or five years there, right? In wow. no, more oh, yeah. than five I, years, I, FTP I, was my go to for a long time. Until for for, I, a, for 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 years and years, it was the only way that I interfaced with my website was through FTP. I'd, I'd upload, I'd store things. It was like Dropbox for me before I had Dropbox. Yes, I would yes. have little folders yes. that I'd upload to. Uh, it's a it's so funny. I don't I don't know the last time I opened up my FTP software. Uh, I don't even know I don't even know I could do it anymore. 
I know. I, it's funny. It's funny you should mention that because I have one thing on my site that I needed to FTP something the other day, this week actually, and I was like, I don't know that I remember how to do this, and I had to stop and think yeah. about like what folders I was putting things in. Anyway, oh boy, this has been two old guys talking about <laughs> file transfer <laughs> protocol. <laughs> and on that note, I want to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about romance and making comics. <laughs> and making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the author of the Web Comics Handbook and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellett, congratulating Brad Geiger on 23 years. I'm the cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave. Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And just a reminder to everyone listening, you could be watching us live right now at the live gab level. We can we are streaming the show live every week for the folks over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And there's a concurrent chat going on right next to it. And we answer questions before, during and after the show. So you can join us. I'm waving to the folks now. And uh, Bradley, what do we got for everybody for this week? Well, before we get into that, I, I do want to say, because I've been thinking a lot about this in terms of 23 years. Uh, there's two things uh, that I've learned over 23 years of doing this that are significant. Okay. The first one really is it's easy to be in the right place at the right time if you just never leave. Yes, right? if yes, you're, that's if you're true. Just yes. Always hanging around. Yes. It's a lot easier to be the, in the right place at the right time. And that's happened for me several times over the last 23 years. And the other one is this. And all you've got to do, I've got this. I, I, the first comic I ever posted, uh, I've got it. Uh, I, I've got a post uh, about my anniversary on my website. It's on all of my social media. I, I always post that first comic uh, on on times like this, and uh, it's not good. It's 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 very much not good. I, it's 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 even a little bit bad. Uh, my this twenty three years is absolute proof that it's very difficult to get worse at something that you do every day. Right. Yes. I, I, if you look yes. at my stuff today and if you look at that first comic that I posted on February 14th, 2000, uh, uh, it, it, I got I got much better. <laughs> I got much better. And, it, and it's kind of reassuring to look at that and say, you know what? You can get better at something if you just keep at it and you keep practicing and you keep uh, trying to improve. Uh, you can get better at some of this stuff. And if and if you're wondering if that's the truth, just look at how terrible that first comic that I posted was. Well, and, you know, I, sometimes joy gets undersold in this process. And there is yeah. joy in looking at your first comic and looking at where you are now. And yeah. seeing the sort of flowering of of uh, talent and hard work and stick to itiveness coming out in in joy filled art that knows what it is and knows what it's doing and knows how to put down a line. And yeah. I think 23 years is to be celebrated. So good on you, my friend. It is. It is. Yeah. But like Brad said, it, it, there is there is no fault, shame or hurt in, in Brad having started with an imperfect first step because it's yeah. not about that first step. It's about the 10,000 that he's taken since then. <laughs> it's about everyone since. Yeah. So, Dave, let's jump into a few questions that we've gotten from some of our Patreon backers over at patreon.com slash comic lab. First one is about thumbnailing. Here's a topic that we haven't talked about uh, too much. This comes over from Make Kong, who says, Dear Ink Shamans, what would you suggest as tips for thumbnailing and pacing when designing the comic book page? So, Dave, let's talk about thumbnailing, something that I don't think we've talked about a whole lot in the past. No, I don't know that we have. And I'll, OK, so I'll, I'll talk about this in that um, I do two very different processes for Sheldon and for Drive. For Sheldon, it's traditional art, ink on paper. For mm -hmm. Drive, it is um, purely digital. And I've done over 5,000 Sheldons at this point, and I, I don't remember, but let's just say I'm like 600 pages in, 700 pages in on Drive. I don't remember. So, okay, 5,700 comics, right? Only, yeah. Brad, only in like the last two years and only sparingly have I started thumbnailing and only yeah. if the page is particularly tricky and I really have to think about it. And yeah. so I, I want to say that I'm now 25 years into this career as we were just gotten done talking. And yeah. only recently have I had the, oh, you know what might be nice is maybe thumbnailing once in a while. That, that yeah. maybe is a good idea that maybe I should do yeah, it once I, in a while. 
So that's that's the dirty little secret about thumbnailing is, by the way, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. And uh, and I got to be honest with you, everybody I talk to uh, kind of uh, when I talk about thumbnailing, they're like, oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. You should absolutely thumbnail before you start working on your comic. Thumbnailing is a crucial, crucial part of it. And I go, do you do it? And they go, oh, me? No. No, I, I I do that on the fly. Every, it, it's 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 like it's like I don't know. It's like eating right, right? Everybody is like agrees that it's very very important to eat right to be healthy. Very few people actually do it, right? Yeah. Uh, Thumbnailing is the same thing. Uh, so here's here's the irony of this topic uh, on on Comic Lab. We're gonna talk to you about thumbnailing, knowing full well that you should do it, and you probably won't. And knowing yeah. full well that when I sit down over there to do my next comic, I'm probably going to be thumbnailing on the fly. Yeah. Uh, and a lot, a lot of my process has become kind of a, uh, uh, it, 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 it's made it a lot easier to thumbnail on the fly. In other words, I'm using a lot of Clip Studios 3D uh, uh, modeling uh, uh, to set up. So I can do a very quick shift of the room. I can make worm's eye. I can do bird's eye. I can go over to the left. I can spin to the right. I can I can get a whole bunch of compositions in front of my eyes very, very quickly uh, and decide which one is best. And I can uh, put them all on the same page and make adjustments to see how that page shapes together very, very quickly and then start doing my penciling, uh, which is a form of thumbnailing. But uh, if you're not doing that, and and particularly if you're just starting your journey, if, if you're at the beginning of your 23 or your 25 years, uh, you really should be taking some time to thumbnail. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and so we're going to give you some best practices. We're going to give you some tips for that. Uh, and, and then it's up to you. We just we just hope that you actually do it. after. Yeah, that. this is the equivalent of us sitting you down in the dentist chair saying, how you know what you should do? You should floss. You really should oh floss. God. Yeah, I, I just went to the dentist. I, I got a new dentist not so long ago, and it was my first visit. And she sits me in the chair and she goes, Brad, uh, are, are you flossing regularly? And I said, listen, you and I just met. It's very early for you to put me in a situation where I got to start lying to you already. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's wait until like the second or third visit for me to really start telling you lies. Uh, then, but, but on the first meeting, let's, let's, keep, be, let's keep it polite. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like flossing. Uh, everybody, everybody knows that they should floss. Nobody's actually flossing unless they get actually something stuck in their teeth. Then that flow, you dust the... The, the, the floss container off and you, <laughs> and you start flossing, but, uh, but, but it, it really is like that. Uh, but, but just like flossing, you should be doing this. Yeah. So I think, okay, let's talk about some, some best practices for thumbnailing that I think could be wor uh, workable for most situations, which is, um, helpful aids when doing thumbnailing are size discrepancy and, uh, and color discrepancy in the yeah. way you are doing quick thumbnailing versus the way you will be doing your final inks, whether it's actually in ink or whether it's in digital. Um, one of the reasons why pencil thumbnailing works so quickly is that mentally you know that the carbon of a pencil is disposable. It's like, yeah. it's in, it, it could be gotten rid of in a second with an eraser, right? Yep. And so it allows for a certain freedom. And there's also a freedom because it is a different color. It's lighter, it's not as permanent as that ink that's eventually gonna go on the page. So I often advise uh, people that are working digital to set your color as a very different color than the ink that you're eventually gonna use. So if you're inking in black ink, um, for your line work, then you're going to set your in a light blue or a light red. And then I would further allow your eye to have a sense of impermanence by making the transparency on that thumbnailing layer like 30 percent, 20 percent, something that feels like a wisp of willow that you can get rid of at, at, at will if you need to, that it's not yeah. permanent. It's not important. It kind of reinforces for your mind that this too shall pass. Don't don't focus on the nose of this character. Just get the basic mm -hmm. shape of the character down. Just get the action. Just get the motion down. Um, and so I think that can help. Uh, Brad, first first ones from you. What do you think? 
I would even encourage you to do thumbnailing in, in an analog sense. In other words, I don't know that I would even encourage you to do digital thumbnailing in that oh. I would much rather see you get like a, uh, a, 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 a book or a pad of graph paper, right? So it's got the little lines there for you, you the little cubes for you to work inside. And I would encourage you to do two or three versions of every panel right? Very, very quick, just quick compositions, foreground, background, shapes, word balloons. Uh, it, it shouldn't take you more than like 10 seconds to do each one of these panels and, 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 and then decide, okay, does this panel work best as a square? Does it work best as a horizontal? Does it work best as a vertical? Uh, and then once you've got each one of these best panels, then you decide how you're going to put them on the page. All right. And then that's going into how do these panels work next to each other? How do those compositions play with each other? Yep. yep. Uh, how, how does all of that fit together in, in, in the overall page that you're trying to compose? Uh, and, and so you're going to spend two or three pages on, on every comic book page because you're going to be trying out layouts for those panels then you're going to be trying out layouts for the page itself once you've decided uh, that the overall shape of each one of those panels. Uh, I, and, and, and for that, I think I would want you to do that, especially so you don't get bogged down in details. I'd want you to do that with a piece uh, with with a with some graph paper and a pencil and just just nail it right up. Bop, 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 bop. And you can you can buy uh, like a, a sketchbook full of, of graph paper uh, for that same reason. And just keep that along with your sketchbook off to the side just for thumbnailing and yeah, and, and, yeah. and just to build those in. Then if you want to go back and fill in some uh, some shades, like some dark shades and stuff like that to start looking at the tonal variety in your compositions, that's that's perfectly fine. But I I, I would even encourage you to, to kind of do this analog uh, again, to to uh, help reinforce that this is something that you're just going to throw away. It's it's quick, quick, down and dirty. I think if you're doing it on the screen, you, you're you're doing it with the idea that eventually those are going to turn into pencils, and the pencils are going to turn into inks. And I think mentally that could get you bogged down a little bit. Okay, interesting. I I yeah. uh, even though I don't personally. Uh, do that, I actually see a lot of value in that. So yeah, I would yeah. I would co-sign that as a, a super valid path to doing it. I would say the other thing aside from color that I find helpful in thumbnailing is size. And this, this is sort yeah, of where the name yeah. thumbnailing came from, which is you you can use size uh and in this case smaller 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 versions of the page or the panel or the or the the flow of the comic strip whatever you're doing. Uh a much smaller version helps you see the forest for the trees in that sometimes when you're working on a panel, you don't realize that you're accidentally creating a bunch of tangencies with all the panels around you. And you've you've made a, a, a when someone looks at a page holistically, all these panels are a jumbled mess because they're all fighting against each other. And sometimes when you thumbnail a page in a in a small way, say you're eventually gonna draw the page, I don't know, eight by ten uh inches wide. Uh, you can do a two by three uh, that is a much smaller version, right? You're you're getting down the flow and the details, but you're getting the whole page as a holistic thing uh, so that in some ways it helps you see the page as the reader that's flipping that page over in a book will see it very quickly over a microsecond. Their brain will take it in as a full unit. And mm -hmm. sometimes your thumbnailing, sketching it small, can help you see that in a way that you don't see when you're working on panel one, panel two, panel three. You yeah. know, you're so the thumbnail helps you take it in all at once. How am I going to create the energy of this page in a way that working on individual panels doesn't? Yeah, and I think that's the main thing with thumbnailing is you're trying to capture energy. Yeah, right. You're really trying to just zero in on 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 basic basic ideas, basic big shapes. Uh, and, and then you're using that for kind of a blueprint for your next stage. Uh, it, it is the, the worst thing you can do is put a whole lot of detail into that. It, it might even be smart, Dave, uh, to encourage people to use like a timer as they're working on this, just cause you know, like, like 30 seconds times up, you got to move to the next thing times up. You got to move to the next thing. Uh, because really, uh, this is something that should be done. Uh, it, 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 the more time you spend on it, it's kind of like the worst 
of uh, uh, effects that you get yeah. in terms of each individual uh, panel. You really, really want to just get basic ideas down there. Uh, and 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 again, uh, we say this fully. We're not BSing you at all. Uh, this is something that I've gotten to the point where I do a lot of it in my head. Me too. And I do a lot of it on the screen. Uh, but if you're starting out and you don't have that uh, that background and you haven't had years and years of uh, sc- screwing up and learning from mistakes like I have, this is something that really could benefit you. I really hope you consider some of these. But uh, but I'm not I'm having talked to people about this for years and years. I'm I'm, I'm not optimistic. Yeah. And I want to say, like Brad, I'm coming at this from a place of humility in that I've gone 25 years where most of my comics never had a thumbnail, never had yeah. like I did it in my head or I did it with a quick, I don't know, pre-sketch rather. I, I wouldn't call it a thumbnail. It was like, no, I'm getting things down. This is this is where I'm putting it. And now yeah. I'm going to commit to figuring out how to do it. But right. I will say right. that now when I'm trying to do a new camera angle or I have a page or panels where the amount of and placement of the text and the amount and placement of the energy of the artwork where I know they're going to be fighting one another. Boy, is that a great opportunity to do some quick thumbnailing and then yeah. follow it up by a little bit of penciling in a way that I wouldn't normally do. So uh, I'm again, but I'm coming at this from humility. Like Brad, I don't do it uh, for the most part. Yeah. I should do it. And when I do do it, I find that a color change and a size change is very helpful for my process in getting yeah. ideas down quickly. So Dave, here's another question, and it's a it's an art related question. As long as I, I figure we just got done talking about thumbnails, what's better than to start talking about hands? We're just going to transition <laughs> right into another body part. <laughs> Cosmo's written in, and he says, "Hey, I have an issue with drawing hands and feet. Are there any books you guys would recommend, or any tips? So let's talk about drawing hands and feet." Oh, boy. Everyone's favorite topic, the two bits of human anatomy that make no sense. Uh, So uh, one of the charming things about cartooning, I think, is that depending on where you fall on the realism to iconicity scale, like think of it as sort of a a long spectrum, right? And the most iconic thing is like a bone or a peanuts on one end or, you know, the yeah. most the most iconic you can draw a body. And on the other end is like a John Byrne or a, or a, or a Jim Lee drawing on the other side, you know, fairly realistic in mm-hmm. terms of cartooning. Um, depending on where you fall on that scale, one of the things that I find most charming about comics is they took the eternal problem of art, which is the drawing a human hand or mm-hmm. drawing a human foot, and they said, what if it's Close just enough. a round ball with little sausages coming out of it? Could, yeah, it, could that yeah. be a human hand? And they're like, yeah, you know what? On on Oswald the Mal- uh, the Lucky Rabbit, that is what a hand is. It's just yeah. a ball with little sausage things coming out of it. And we sort of all sort of winkingly uh, make it fun. What's this impossible task? I n- fall a little bit more on the iconic side of things and the realism mm-hmm. side of things. So what I try to do is capture the energy of a human hand, which is different than the realism of a human hand. Yeah. Um, But I would, I would, so I would love to hear Brad who falls, I I would say a little bit more on the realism side um, than the iconic side. How do you handle this, Brad, in terms of drawing human hands and feet? I think there's only one way. If you find that your art is a little bit more towards the realistic side and you're, and you're like, yep, you, you can't get away with, doing that 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 style that became very popular like in the 1970s with wizard of id and ziggy where they would just draw a hand and then do loop 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 and you're done you know it was just they they didn't care it was again more about capturing the energy than the essence uh so if you find yourself that you've got it if you can't get away with that i think there's only one thing to do and that's draw hands and feet. I mean, listen, um, you, I, I, I'm not going to recommend a book because honest to goodness, if you go into a bookstore and find one book that's talking about drawing hands and feet, it's going to be about as good as the next book that's going to talk to you about drawing hands and feet. I don't know. I don't know that one book has the magic formula and, and, and they're going to talk about all because hands and feet are kind of the same no matter what. So they're going to have a lot of the same strategies, a lot of the same approaches uh, and all that's well and good. And if you feel you need a book, go to your local bookstore, 
uh, I'll always support your local used bookstore, particularly, uh, and, and, and pick up a couple of books. If you feel that's what you need, honest to goodness, if you want my advice, uh, you, you've got a hand, hold it up in front of your face. Yeah, you see that? Now draw it. Okay. And when you're done with that, I've got it just gets more complicated from here on in. I got a three-step process. Number one, take your shoes off. Number two, take your socks off. Number three, draw your freaking foot. <laughs> or, or or if you don't, you know, if you want a different angle, then take a photograph. You you've got a phone. Uh take a take a photo. Look up photos of hands and feet on the internet. Uh, it, it, there's lots of ways to get that image in front of you and then sit down and figure out how you mentally recreate that image uh, for, in a way that looks good. Right. And of course, the first few are going to look horrible, just like that first comic I did 23 years ago didn't look very good. Uh, the only way for you to get better at it, whether you do it my way or whether you read a book about it uh, or, or you do some other uh, mumbo jumbo the only way you're going to get better is to practice. Yeah, I, I think the um, like Brad said, looking at your hand and staring at the mechanics of how the thumb is working in opposition from the fingers, how the muscles yeah. are pulling a finger forward. Right. That's one of the reasons why, you know, in the classic Renaissance days, Da Vinci and Michelangelo used to take part in um medical uh what do you call it brad where they they slice open a body oh forget. like they were uh, they were going through autopsies and, autopsies and going into yeah they would find they'd find a body that got that got to you know a, a, probably from a poor house then they'd, they'd slice it open and they could they would basically try to figure out how is the the muscles across your palm pulling the middle finger towards you or how yeah. is the how are the muscles from the base of the thumb pulling it towards the pinky right and so what I do with cartooning is if you're drawing a human smile, you're basically drawing the action of the muscles up around your ears, pulling your muscles across your cheek to create that sort of upward curve, right? And so um, in that spectrum that I talked about with realism and iconicity, find the one or two key muscles that move a human hand around to try to get the gesture that you're getting and work yeah. from that point as a starting um, it's not going to it's not going to be Renaissance levels of art, but it at least gives you an initial good thrust of like try to try to figure out which way the muscles are. The main muscles are pulling and how that opposition, how that force creates um, a pleasing shape in cartoon uh, realism rather than realism realism. Yeah. And it is. And listen, all kidding aside, it is worth uh, taking some time to, to, to do right. A, a lot of times in pro-am comics. The first thing you kind of notice is the hands uh, is somebody maybe that that is drawing uh, hands that kind of instead of having three joints, it almost looks like they just have two and the finger kind of goes up and then curves and it looks more like a claw. Right. Yeah. That can be distracting. That can be something that takes your reader out of the moment. Uh, and so it is important, e e even if you are anywhere along that uh, uh, that that continuity that dave was talking about between iconic and realistic uh it, it is worthwhile taking a little bit of time to to draw uh, hands and and to fill a sketchbook up with hands uh, at different angles with different gestures it's it really is going to improve your work and it's going to make you more confident as an artist so it, it it's something that very much no matter which one of these uh, systems you use uh, it's worth a little bit of time improving because it's just going to up your game uh, even more uh, along the way. Yeah. And it's one of those rising tides that if you're getting better at drawing hands, you're getting better at drawing in general. So mm -hmm. like you're understanding mm -hmm. better the mechanics of life and how fabric flows across a pressure point or how yeah. uh, how a, a seat cushion works when a butt hits it and presses it down, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it but like the Eternals for art, like horses, like bicycles, Human hands are are a flippin' trial uh, to to go down, and know that it's a process. You're going to get better yeah. at it, uh, but in the meantime, try to establish um, a, a system of sh <laughs> I was going to say short hands, <laughs> but in a way, it kind of is short hands of the imp the uh, iconistic imp imperfect version 
that gets across what you're trying to say and in a way that doesn't distract. In a way, it's kind of like a word balloon. You want it yeah. to have just enough there to get the message across without distracting and pulling attention. That's your goal with hands for the first yep. five to 10 years. It's just like, just don't draw attention to them. You know, like get, yeah. get out the basic information and get, get out, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, we've talked about hands an awful lot uh, and and just as difficult as it is to draw hands, it's very difficult to draw feet, right? There's feet are just awkward, awkward looking appendages. And, and, and there's a couple things that are worth noting just in general about feet that, that I realized once I started kind of figuring it out for myself, my feet took a big step forward, if, if you will. Uh, number one, the heel goes a little bit behind the leg, right? Uh, so many people, when they draw feet, it's like a right angle. The leg comes down, there's a right angle, and the foot comes out, and that's a foot. Well, the heel juts back a little bit to balance that, right? That's mm -hmm. worth taking a little bit of time to notice how that foot attaches to the ankle. That heel's going to come back a little bit. Take a look at the bottom of a foot and how that's structured. You've got kind of two main masses there after the arch of the foot that come into uh, that that front uh, padding of the foot. Take a look at how the toes attach uh, to that foot. It's worth taking a little bit of time to do that. And even if you end up going, here's the deal. If you learn to draw uh, a somewhat realistic foot and just take a little bit of time doing it, when you go back and draw that iconistic looking foot, that's very what we would say, quote unquote, cartoony, mm -hmm. uh, a cartoony looking foot, when you've learned the, the the mechanics of that foot and how it works, your iconistic foot is going to look so much better yes, because it's, that's true. those lines are going to be informed by that study that you did. So it's worth take, it's worth taking time to do. Uh, no matter how you do it, I don't care how you do it. The important thing is that you do it. All, all of these things are going to come down to the same thing, whether you do a book or look at a website or take a look at your own hand. No matter what you start out, at some point, you got to put uh, a, a pencil to paper and start drawing the damn thing. Yeah, all right. Yeah. That's the thing that you got to make sure that you do and do it over and over and over and over and over again, a whole bunch of times. Right. Then fill it, fill a, a, a dozen pages with hands and feet. And, and then next week, fill another dozen and right. really, really concentrate on it. If it's something that you're worried about, uh, I, uh, because it is going to raise your craft. It is going to raise the level of your work and it's going to inform all those drawing decisions you make. Uh, and, and the, and the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be with it. Well, and Brad, you had mentioned seventies comics uh, and the way they drew hands. And one of the most iconic ones for me, seventies comic wise, in terms of the way they drew hands was, was Ziggy. And you had that Ziggy hanging over your desk, Brad, if I remember, where he talks about human hands. And I just, I, I wonder for the folks at home, if you could share that Ziggy punchline about human hands uh, that he had over your desk. Yeah, you know, it is funny you mentioned that because it's sitting right here. I'm looking right at it. It's that Ziggy I've got framed right sitting right here. And it, and it the punchline is absolutely about uh, hands. And, and, and the punchline reads like this. It says, uh, you know, every now and again, somebody needs a helping hand. But you ask yourself, who's missing a hand and who's helping them? <laughs> oh, God, you triggered my asthma. Oh, my God, that was so terrible. It triggered my asthma. <laughs> Well, you got it. You got to. There's a little illustration. There's a dismembered hand inside of a box. You got to. You've got to have the whole. You got to have the whole gestalt yeah. going. Yeah, and just for you. just for to complete the picture, the parrot is sitting on his stick, uh, yeah. kind of looking aghast at the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's one of the more you, famous you things because it, it never reran, so it's one of the more famous <laughs> ones. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have a hard time finding this one. This is a collector's <laughs> item. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. 
Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Dave, it's time for an update, and today's update is... Get your taxes done. It's mid-March, and that means we're staring at maybe four more weeks to get your taxes done, get get your taxes uh, uh, prepped and sent in uh, to the appropriate places. Uh, We always recommend here at Comic Lab working with an accountant. If if you have any amount of freelance uh, income that you need to uh, uh, show uh, and, and pay taxes for, uh, we're not as strong uh, at, at some of those storefront places that you can go, but we are very uh, encouraging to to actually work with a CPA who can sit down and go through your specific uh, items. Uh, one general piece of advice, though, that we have to give is for people that it, let's say you're doing your taxes and you realize that you're going to owe a little bit of money on April 15th. And maybe like a lot of us, you just don't have that money sitting around. All right. That's a that's a real world situation that happens to people. If you find yourself in that situation, I, I've got some advice for you, uh, because a lot of people make a mistake when it comes to this, uh, because what they say is, oh, shit, <laughs> I'm going to end up owing money to the government and right. I can't write that check on April 15th. So they just don't file their taxes at all. They think, well, if I don't file, maybe nobody will notice, right? And, and, and I can slide under the radar. Unfortunately, there's very little sliding to be done uh, with the IRS. And you're making a huge mistake if you're avoiding filing uh, because you can't pay. And here's why. The penalty for failing to file is 5%. The penalty for failing to pay is 0.5%. Oh, All right. Oh, oh, oh. The penalty to file failing to file your return is equal to 5% of the money you owe up to a maximum of, of 25% of your unpaid taxes. And it accumulates every month you're late. Okay. That's for failing to file. Failing to pay, however, is penalized at 0.5% of the unpaid taxes for every month you're late up to 25%. In other words, the penalty is 10 times worse if you don't file your taxes. So if you're in a situation like that, the best thing to do is to file and then get in touch with the IRS uh, and work out some kind of a payment plan. You would not be the first person to find out that this is actually uh, a lot more easy than uh, we've been we've been told on, on uh, pop culture and social media. Uh, you're just going to get in touch and say, here's the situation that I'm in. You won't be the first person they've talked to today (laughs) that have been in that situation and you'll work out a payment plan and you'll get back on track. This is not a time to panic. All right. It feels it feels very panic inducing, uh, but you're going to go through this. You're going to learn. You're going to do it the right way. You're going to file even if you can't pay because uh, avoiding filing at all is 10 times worse uh, in terms of that money that you're eventually going to have to fork over. So if you find yourself in a bad position, file those taxes and then work out a plan. Uh, It's much, much better in the long run. And listen, this is my annual complaint that it is bonkers to me that the um, the lobbying of Intuit and TurboTax has kept it where the average salaried American doesn't just automatically get generated a form uh, saying, here are the taxes you owe and you go ahead and sign it and send it in like Europe does, because it is bonkers to me that that doesn't exist. Granted, that wouldn't help us as independent freelance uh, art creators. But God, for most salaried right. people, the fact that that doesn't exist in America is bonkers to me. Thank you, Intuit. And thank you, TurboTax, for, for lobbying <laughs> Congress on that one. All right. Well, Brad, I wanted to jump us into because you had a really interesting idea that I thought would be fun. We thought would be fun to talk about, which is uh, the idea of fake it till you make it, which we often oh. hear for young up and coming artists as the mm-hmm. thing to do. Um, and, uh, you hear it from, from good sources, bad sources. And, yeah. and, uh, you had a, a couple of really interesting points that I thought were, were fantastic to bring onto the show. Well, I saw this, I saw this advice going around on, on social media, which was basically fake it till you make it and extolling the virtues of fake it till you make it kind of thinking. And it, I gotta be honest with you. And I wanted to talk to you to kind of find out 
Uh, you know, maybe maybe I'm flying off half cocked here. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. But there's something about fake it till you make it mentality that really scares me, especially talking to a younger creator, uh, because so often the only person you're faking is yourself. Right. You're 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 really not faking uh, anybody out. You're 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 faking yourself and you're spending so much time faking that you don't spend enough time making. All right. Right. So we got to talk about what that actually means to fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. If you if you take that to mean, listen, you need to have confidence to put your work out there, even if you don't think it's very good yet. You need to have confidence. Put it out there. Keep putting it out there. Yep. And eventually, like we talked about at the top of the show, it's it's hard to get worse at something that you do every day. You're going to eventually make it. That's good advice. That's good advice. I think the problem that I come down to with this, and and you can tell me if I'm if I'm at wrong about this, is this idea of faking it. I don't. I I know it's it's supposed to be an axiom and it rhymes and everything. I don't like fake it. I don't <laughs> it like fake it. And everything. I think <laughs> I think this idea of faking it is 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 you're fooling yourself. I think I I, I think you have to be honest with yourself. And when you're faking it, you're you're fooling yourself. Uh, and again, you're faking it, faking it, faking it. You're not spending any time actually working on making it. It's, 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 it's not like it mat. It's not like the make it part magically appears. Right. And all this right. time now you can stop faking it hey, because now you're making it. The only way to get from fake it mode to make it mode is, is to, to, to realize that you're not there yet. And that means uh, identifying the things with your work that isn't uh, up to snuff, isn't up to speed. Uh, maybe my writing's not that good yet. Maybe my art's not that good yet. Maybe I've got some ideas about social media that don't uh, that come into play. Maybe my publishing isn't uh, uh, taking full advantage of the tools I've got. Uh, you can't make those decisions if you're if you're busy out there faking it, right? Just just going along, just posting everything. Well, I'm just I'm I, I must be doing something right at. The, the, the fake it part bothers me and I'm having a hard time crystallizing what it is that really bugs me about that whole fake it till you make it stuff. No, I think you're on the right path here. I think where the phrase for cartoonists specifically, where the phrase comes in handy, fake it till you make it doesn't come until like fourth tier level cartooning. By that, I mean, now you're at Comic-Con and you're selling or you're creating a booth or you're putting yeah. up your store on the online. That's oh. where fake it till you make it can can help you because you're trying to let the consumer feel like you're more established. You know what you're doing. This is a good book you should buy. Uh, it's not going to fall apart in your hands when you get it home. That's where I think. But to me, I think you're intuiting the right thing here, which is you can't fake a good comic if it's not good, you know. And so yeah. it's, uh, you know, the, the, for example, a lot of life, they say, uh, you know, dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. Well, how how does that kind of thinking, which is a form of fake it till you make it, how does that kind of thinking help cartooning at all? It's the it's the final product of the comic that matters, yeah. not yeah. whether or not you were dressed well or looking well or or presenting to the world that I am a cartoonist and I'm doing it. It's it's the actual cartoon, and and that's why in a way that I think is wonderfully equalizing, you and I can see someone like Ellen who we had on the show. Uh, a couple weeks ago, um, do this amazing growth in two years because she's putting out consistently good work. It's not a matter of faking it. It's a matter of putting yeah. out good work consistently, putting in the work and having the end results of that work be a super pleasant comic that people want to share and read and go back to again and again. And that part, you can't fake. You can't fake whether or not a comic is good. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got, I've got, see, as you're talking, you actually opened up a whole new part of this that bothers me. And, and I want to get into that next. Okay. And Dave, maybe it's just because I'm a uh, contrarian, <laughs> right? I maybe, maybe, but when you were talking about, uh, you know, comic conventions and books, I, I think maybe that crystallizes the problem I've got with uh, fake it till you make it. Uh, so let me let me see if I can take another run at uh, gathering sure. my thoughts up because it it has it, it it's one of those things that it just irks me and I haven't been able to really uh, figure out why. 
I like fake it till you make it in the sense that uh, to give an artist, particularly somebody who's drawing or a writer who's, you know, feeling their way through finding their voice. Uh, I like in that you, you need to be confident. You need to put your work out there, even though you feel you're not ready yet. I like that aspect of fake it till you make it. So as art advice, as writing advice, I, I get fake it till you make it. And sure. I like fake it till you make it. I guess the problem that I start to see is when you're make you're doing fake it till you make it to make business decisions. And that's where I see people doing oh. comic conventions before they're ready to do a comic convention. They're mm-hmm. doing books, print on demand books before they're, they actually have the market support to do a Kickstarter book, right? It's where you start to use fake it till you make it. Uh, and, and we can go down the line, t-shirts, merchandise, all uh, Doing the pay, starting, we've talked about this so much, starting your Patreon before you're really ready to start a Patreon. And as a result, making yourself miserable because now you're sta- staring at single digit Patreon backers, right? That, that, that ma- is making you feel like a failure. Uh, all of these things stack up into this fake it till you make it mentality when we apply it to business decisions. And maybe that's what's bugging me. Cause I, I, well, I'm telling a young artist, fake it till you make it, it, it to encourage them to put their art out on social media when they don't feel they're ready yet. Right. That I get it's when you start using that for business decisions that I really start to have a problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, I hear you because there are, are a lot of different ways we've seen this manifest, but it's having, it's wanting to have all the trappings of being a cartoonist of look at me. Yeah. I've got a Kickstarter and a Patreon and a first book and I'm uh, making pins and all, all this. And I got, you know, without having done quite enough of the work such that it warrants the Patreon and the Kickstarter and the books and the pins, but I, it's wanting to, I, I know what you mean that it's, it's, um, it's the equivalent of like a corporate person that buys a briefcase, but there's nothing to put in the briefcase. You know, you're like, well, why, yeah. why, why are we do, even doing this? What, what's happening here? What are we going? You're all hat and no cowboy. Yeah, all, all hat and no cowboy. Exactly. So, um, so yes, I take your meaning there. Uh, yeah. I think, like you, I think so much of this comes down to, especially for younger cartoonists, so much of the world wants to tell you that you're no good and you don't belong here and go yeah. away yeah. and leave us alone. And sometimes your own brain is telling you that that you're really, you're just trying to find any strategy you can that reinforces what your heart is trying to tell you, which is that you matter, you should be here, you should be a cartoonist, you should share your work, you you are valuable, you are important. And so, I like you, I think phrases like this exist in part to reinforce, like, no, you do matter, your art matters, yeah. it's good that you're doing this, it's good that you're getting better, you're not there yet, but you're on the path, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And so may, I, uh, there's obviously better ways to say that. But I think like you, when it when it's used in that respect, I get it. I get the idea that it's it's just trying to reinforce for younger or insecure cartoonists that your work has a place and it and it should be shared. Yeah. But um, what's funny, I, I don't know why my brain jumped back to this. Remember when I a minute ago when I said, um, you know, just dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. Yeah. If someone wanted to be a cartoonist. Dressing for the job that you wanted <laughs> would be wearing a five-year-old T-shirt that you got free from Wacom at a Comic Con uh, yeah. in, in in nineteen or twenty thousand eighteen, <laughs> and and some comic and, and some coffee-stained sweatpants. Yeah, yes, exactly. It is it is the exact opposite of what most uh, dressing uh, jobs would would suit for. I mean, no, but I think you're right. You're on the right path. That that it's. Uh, it's when it's used to give you all the tra- the emotional trappings of a cartoonist without doing right. the work or focusing on the work or putting the focus on the work like it should be. That's where yeah. I think people get into trouble. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's the best crystallization of what I'm trying to say there. I, I, that's that's the closest I've come yet. So listen, now that we've uh, uh, done therapy for Brad <laughs> and worked through his <laughs> mental issues, let's go back to answering some Patreon questions. This one coming in from Emily, who says, uh, Dave, speaking of faking it till we're making it, how do you avoid continuity errors? I have found the more I work on my webcomic, the easier it is to avoid the big mistakes, leaving out a character's distinguishing feature or putting a distinguishing feature on the wrong side of the body. 
However, I find myself making small mistakes all the time, like the door is opening in the wrong direction, putting coffee cups or stacks of paper in the wrong hand, leaving out some sort of detail that is scripted to be mentioned or noticed by a character later on in the story. And the question is, Dave, how do you avoid the big ones are easy, right? Your character's sure. got a mustache. You give him a mustache in every panel, right? Your character wears a, a, a red dress. You put her in a red dress every those are easy. How do you do the small ones? Like remembering that your character is left-handed and is always going to carry the stapler in their left hand. How do you do this? How, how do you do continuity uh, consistently over the course of a years and years and years of doing comics? This is this is the show where I admit a lot of humility because yeah. much like uh, me with thumbnailing, I want to say that despite decades of trying to do this right, yeah. I fail all the time with continuity errors. And so there, the, the sort of three-step process that I have is, A, do my best. I try to jot down and make notes of important things in a way that uh, are mean only uh, to me, what, uh, a way of capturing ideas, capturing details, such that at four months from now, four years from now, when I'm coming back to that story point, I still remember it, right? So I do do my best. But the other two things that I do are I try to practice kindness with myself that like I'm writing this big sprawling story and drive. Mm -hmm. There are going to be details that make I make a mistake with. There are going to be things I forget. There are going to be things I draw wrong. There's going to be specific yeah. uh, vocal inflections that I forget to write to or ticks that I for a character that I forget to incorporate into the comic, right? Um, and, and that's why number three is the most important, which is I genuinely have a multi-stage process for capturing and filtering mistakes until it, before it goes into book form, which is sort of yeah. the final, uh, the final commission. Right. And so when I draw something, I send it to my assistant Beth for coloring and she'll often go, Hey, you have this entire character drawn backwards. Their, their lapel yeah. goes this way, not that way. I go, Oh God, you know, or, or, Hey, you completely forgot the new headdress that he's wearing or the bow tie that he's wearing since the last yeah. scene started. Oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm I got to change that. And then the second one is uh, readers going, hey, yeah. hey, Patreon catches it first. And so yeah. the, the true readers on Patreon kindly catch it. And often I'm able to fix it before it goes on the website. Mm -hmm. And then at the website, it goes to the wider public. And then over the next couple of years, people will catch different things. Um, yeah. Then I crowdsource proofreading before I go to book, uh, book form. And then even at the book form, I am still capturing things that are that are uh, continuity errors or errors in general. And yeah. I, I have to allow a level of kindness to myself that it's going to slip through. But um, the multi-stage editing process is the only way I've found that works for me. How about for you? Yeah, I, it much very much the same. I, I uh, There's a number of Patreon readers that I've got that are very, very good at uh, catching continuity errors. Uh, and, and, and let's face it, I don't think there's a creator uh, alive that doesn't appreciate uh, a polite heads up on something like a continuity error. Uh, every now and again, I'll, I'll get one of these that starts with the word um, that, like they'll actually yeah. take the time to type out the word um or uh, or, or even worse, I, I hate to tell you, but right. Nobody, nobody believes that you hate to tell us that, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that just speaking in kindness, uh, we love when you take the time to give us a helpful heads up on Absolutely. continuity error. Putting um or uh in front of it is smug and condescending. That we that we don't appreciate. <laughs> it's the, if you find a continuity continuity error in somebody's comic, the best thing to do is just to just the same way as if you were giving them bad news, right? Because that's what you're doing. You're giving us bad news. Yeah. Quick, direct, to the point, and out. Hey, heads up. I noticed you've got the duck's beak on backwards. Just wanted you to know. Or whatever. It doesn't have to be, um, isn't the duck's, or or here's one they do all the time, Dave. They'll say, um, that duck must be walking backwards because his beak is pointing at his butt. Or try to make it funny. Oh, trying looks to make like, it funny. Looks oh. like the duck had his Wheaties on, but no, no, no. Come on. Just listen, listen. <laughs> Just say, hey, heads up. Bing, bong, boom, done, period. Thank. 
that I can't tell you how much. And I speak, I think, unless I'm crazy, I think I'm speaking on behalf of creators the world over. We appreciate the quick, polite heads up. We don't need the um. We don't need the uh. We don't need the smart remark. We don't need you to try to be funny. We super, super, we value you as a human being so much. If you take the time to give it to us, just just don't torture us in the process. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. give it to us straight. Yeah. And listen, you also uh, write, uh, write yourself uh, solutions in this regard. If you find that you are consistently making continuity errors with a certain type of thing in your comic, whether it's a visual continuity error or a factual continuity error in terms of storyline or plot or character back history, um, find an easy and easily referenceable way around your desk to put up key facts that you know you're yes. going to forget or know yeah. that you're going to, you know, even if it's a checklist saying, hey, before you put this comic out, check these 10 things. Did a character talk about their backstory? Well, take a hot second and go back and look at their backstory. Just may, may double check. Is there a specific uniform or costume or outfit or look that a character has that you consistently get wrong? Put that on the checklist. Um, yeah. uh, basically write yourself a solution around your desk uh, that can help you catch that in time. Because like Brad said, no matter the best of intentions that you have, you're going to get readers that are going to give you kind of a neckbeard response of, um, actually, it'll drive you bonkers. Um, far better for you to catch it than for them to catch it. And I do have one piece of actionable advice for this. And, and it's actually some advice I've given before uh, in terms of making your writing very tight and taut. Uh, but it also has an ulterior motive uh, as well. And, and it has a broader application. If you've ever heard me say, keep your readers on a need to know basis. Yes. This yes. This has a continuity yes. uh, approach too. And I'll tell you exactly how I learned this the hard way. Back in the day, back when I was doing uh, Evil Inc. as a comic strip and I was self-syndicating to newspapers, I needed a Saturday version of the strip. And I realized from web comics, if I did plot on Saturday, nobody was reading it because nobody was reading that Saturday strip, right? I think today things might be a little bit different, but I still just out of habit don't post anything important on a, on a weekend in, 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 on my website. Right. However, I needed something for Saturdays. So I came up with this idea of the personnel file. It was something I could swipe art from a previous comic so I wouldn't have to redraw it. And then I would just give you all these facts about this character, when they, uh, how old they are, how much, uh, like I have superheroes and villains. So what their powers were, what their origin story was, what, how much they, uh, how strong they were, all of this stuff, how tall, how short, all kinds of facts I put into these personnel files, which eventually some of my readers started to use to torture me with, because if I said this character uh, loves chocolate ice cream in the personnel file, and then years later, they're uh, uh, walking down the, the road with a cone of pistachio, I'd have somebody saying, oh, I thought they only like chocolate ice yeah. cream. Uh, I was giving away a whole lot of facts that I thought I was doing out of fun, my readers were taking as a major point of continuity and then torturing me with. Now, this this is a different, this isn't important to the story. This is just, well, if you if you said that he was 57 years old, then and now you've got him walking around uh in 1948. How does this I was tripping myself up by giving my readers too many facts. Yes. And they were yes. and then they were, some of my readers were, were must have been memorizing these goddamn facts. And then they would come back and trip me up later. So, uh, especially if you do a, a, a long form storyline comic like mine that has a sweeping story that started in 2016 and have a lot of facts that are chained together. Uh, I immediately stopped doing those personnel files because I was giving away too many facts and facts that weren't important. What what year this character was born in? Not important. And in fact, the way I handle time in my comic, it, 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 it's squishy time, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's, this character is somewhere in his 60s. And He's the past is always 30s. five years ago, no matter what those yeah. five years were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so you got to you got to give yourself some wiggle room as soon as I stopped sharing unnecessary facts all of that stuff stopped i still get patreon backers 
asking me, when are you going to do the personnel files again? When are those coming back? And I always say, oh, yeah, that was really great. I love doing those. Maybe we'll do them again sometime. I got news for you. We're never, ever doing that again sometime <laughs> because I was getting tortured by giving away facts that weren't important to the story and just got used to torture me with later. Yeah. And uh, I really I love Brad's idea of need to know in terms of of sharing details and facts about a yeah. character, a plot, a storyline, a, a, a building, an organization, whatever it is. And yeah. here's what you're kind of doing when you do uh, um, new details coming out in a comic is you're kind of setting up future you with a layup. And the other person hopefully is going to have that slam dunk. But you want to do yeah. the details, the facts, the, the backgrounds in such a way that it doesn't lock you down and this is sort of yeah. where writing gets squishy because you'll know it intuitively if it's too detailed. You want it to be just squishy enough so that if future you decides yes. that they're from France, then they can work that into the story. But if future you decides, oh, no, actually, they're from New York. Well, then you can work that into the story. So you want to say something like, oh, no, no, my childhood, we moved around a lot. You know, great. Yes. Now you set yes. future you up for success because you didn't lock down that they born and grew up and stayed in Toledo, Ohio their whole life. Because then yeah. future you will forget that and write them as having been from Boston or something. And you're like, oh, and right. there'll be a reader bless them they exist who are have photographic memories they remember every detail about your comic be like you said it was toledo in in 2024 that kind of thing oh oh well i guess i okay i gotta rewrite this then yeah so what i'm saying is you'll know it intuitively there's ways to write things such that the facts are squishy and they're malleable and they can be worked in so that future you has the layup and doesn't have a blocked uh, a blocked way to write a new uh, storyline a new plot twist a new thing for the character uh yeah. instead it's a helpful layup like i was saying and 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 don't don't think for a minute that the irony is lost on me as a guy, particularly me, who spent a lot of years wishing somebody would read this fucking comic. Somebody, please, somebody read this comic and think it's important. Somebody care about this guy. I, I spent years hoping that somebody would actually start reading this thing and, and caring about it the way I did. And now I've got a lot of readers uh, that 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 I I I base my entire business on uh, who care very much and yeah. pay very much attention. And sometimes it 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 it, it it's it's not like I'm mad at them. I'm mad at me <laughs> yeah. for screwing up. Uh, but but the irony's not lost on me that now I finally got what I wanted. Readers who care about this thing I'm re writing. And it makes my job a little bit more difficult uh, because honest to goodness, it was a lot easier to write something that nobody was reading. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, boy, do I share Brad's uh, insight on that is that for decades, I was hoping, wishing somebody would care so much about the story that these yeah. facts mattered. And now that yes. they do, they're calling me to the mat on it. And that's yeah. as it should be. But yep. the, so the smallness in me is like, oh, darn it. But the, the, the bigger, kinder artist in me is saying, oh, that's good that they're doing this. That's good. That's helpful. Yeah. And so that's why I say the three steps have to be number one, do your best. Capture the data the best yes. you can around yes. your desk, in your story Bible, in your character Bible, in a way that matters to you. Um, number two is treat yourself with kindness when it happens. It happens yes. to everyone. One. And number three is try to work out a way, a system for incorporating mistakes, either from reader feedback, editor feedback, public feedback. But then also I've had this and we haven't talked about this, Brad. Sometimes a continuity error, if you are good about it, can be a corner that you have painted yourself into that now you have to yeah. write your way out of. I've had that too. Have you had that where you like, oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. I've made a mistake here. So now I got to figure out how to write my way out of this. And that's when that's a, that's a creative problem. And and listen, like all creative problems, that's something that you can uh, look at a, in a positive way or a negative way. Right. Now, if you look at it in a negative way, I got news for you. You're going to have a negative outcome. But if you look at it in a positive way and say, OK, I've written myself into this corner. Now, how am I going to get out? That's where real creativity kicks in. And that's where you can actually find yourself in a much better position coming up with something that you wouldn't have come up with otherwise. Yep, absolutely. And so I, I think um, coming at it from humility is, is always good because even though even the best prepared, I mean, like I, I for example, I love Tolkien. Tolkien yeah. is, sits on the highest pantheon for me of, of writers right. in English. Um, but he wrote it over decades. Of course, there's yes. going to be continuity errors. 
uh, uh, you know, amongst uh, the different species in, in Lord of the Rings and the kingdoms and the histories. And so um, even an artist that I think is at the top, 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 there's going to be continuity errors. And so approach it with a certain level of humility. Yeah. And listen, it's with humility that we bring you uh, this show once again every week. We say, hey, listen, we could go on for hours and hours, but our humility prevents us from doing it. We say we got to about an hour. Uh, I'm humble enough to say that's enough for this week. And that's when I get to say that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, who is the living embodiment of the opposite of continuity error. He is sure, he is steadfast, <laughs> he's like a rock as a friend. He's the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil comic.com. And my friend, who is steady as the sun raising in the sky, you know that it's going to be there every day. Dave Gellis, the same thing. Co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. What made me laugh about that is steady as the sun as it moves across the sky and then falls away to the other side. Okay. We don't see it again I, for 12 I, hours. I, and then... I know that the sun always raises <laughs> in the east and sets in the west but it like it, in the middle of that sentence I knew I had a 50-50 chance of getting it wrong so I just said raising in the sky because I know <laughs> and just like the sure steadfast sun we always know that it's right there in the sky right at that same spot right just left, like Dave Kellen direction. <laughs> and, and no matter which direction that sun comes up it ain't hitting that rainbow sparkler thing I got for my wife I can tell you that Brad is marching angrily back to the dollar store on the Valentine's Day, and I will say the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net, and this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or our favorite platform right now is Spotify, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. Dave, I want to tell you about this uh, little information. <laughs> Speaking of reviews, we got kind of a review not too long ago. Do you remember when we had uh, Ellen Woodbury on who does Pizza Cake Comic? Yep. Uh, and she very kindly put up a, a notification on her Reddit that said that she was going to be on the Comic Lab podcast. And in the many, many replies that she got, we got kind of a little bit of a review of Comic Lab. I'll oh, read yeah? it to you like now. Like a nice shout out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 this person really loves the show. Listen to, listen to what they wrote. Quote, Dave Kellett is a great cartoonist. It might have, it must have been quite an honor. Besides Sheldon, he also drew the illustrations and the other work for the documentary stripped from a year ago. <laughs> for those of you who might be interested, Bill Watterson actually gave an incredibly rare short interview via phone with his thoughts on the film, which that alone is worth the time and the money to rent. This, is, this is the review for Comic that's Lab? That's the whole review. <laughs> that's, that's the period there. There's there's nothing else that comes after that period. And then there's parenthetically, Brad is also involved. <laughs> Brad Geiger, also present. Noted. I mean, it, it would have been nice if he would have said like something like, you know, there's another guy there too. That I would have taken that. You know, there's, there's somebody else that's on the... Nope, nope. It was just... Oh, that must have been a great honor. Dave Kellett is a great cartoonist. Dave Kellett is a great cartoonist. That must have been another, uh, what an honor that must have been. I think there's yeah. another host, perhaps, but I've forgotten the name. It's a very forgettable human. <laughs> I would have even taken that. I, I would have taken anything out of uh, over being ignored, but I, that, that's, I, I'm, just, I'm just not even there. My son saw that on Reddit stopped me in the middle of the day to, to read that review to me and then <laughs> laugh at me for the next five minutes. Uh, I love that my Reddit sock puppets are coming in handy. This is oh this is so God. this is so useful to have those have those accounts to be able to be like Dave Kellett is a great cartoonist. Humanity benefits from Dave Kellett's presence. Yeah, yeah, I know. I figured there was something kind of familiar about that uh, that <laughs> wording. Well, on that note, I'm going to say Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreoncom slash Comic Lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com. Flash Dave Kellett is a great cartoonist. <laughs> Thank you.
You know, the funny thing, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that Ziggy cartoon that I had uh, posted right over my desk, because I, if I remember right, Susan McTaggart uh, had a few thoughts on feet. Oh, oh, hell. Oh, hell. <laughs> How Didn't dare she, you throw me under the bus at the end of the show? You're, I remember last time I was over there, you had it at her her thoughts on feet oh, embroidered on a little pillow that uh, your dog sits on. No, no, it wasn't so much feet. It was about limbs, I think you were thinking about, because she said, friends, friends, hello, Susan McTaggart here, author of the new book, uh, Better You in 40 Days, because 40 Days is 40 Ways. And Okay, so here's the quote, everybody. Uh, uh, friends, Susan McTaggart saying, what is meant for you in life, friends, it'll find you. Especially if, friends, if that's the long arm of the law. Friends, Susan McTaggart saying, be well and be hell. <laughs> uh, be well and be hell. <laughs> oh, it fell apart at the end there. It fell apart at the end there. Uh, 